morning and welcome to St. Mark Lutheran Church. Um, well, as many of you know, uh, I'm, I'm certain that uh, the governor has extended the uh, uh, shelter in place uh, order until May 15th. And so we will uh, continue to do this. Um, we're, this. I'm coming to you this morning. It's Saturday morning, it's about 10.30. And so again, we will continue to do this until such time as um, it is uh, safe uh, to gather together again. And also a reminder, uh, again, yes, we will be here tomorrow morning from 9 to 11. Our faces will be covered, our hands will be meticulously clean, and those who desire to receive Christ in the sacrament you are welcome. And again, we will be here. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also with you. you. Let us pray. O oh God, your Son makes, makes himself known to all his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may see him in his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Acts 2. Today's reading is the conclusion of Peter's sermon preached following the giving of the Holy Spirit to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. The center of his preaching is the bold declaration that God may, has made the crucified Jesus both Lord and Christ. Here is the reading. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Here ends the first reading. Our psalm for today is Psalm 116. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication, for the Lord has given ear to me whenever called. The cords of death entangled me, the anguish of the grave came upon me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray you, save my life. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things God has done for me? I will lift the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. Precious in your sight, O Lord, is the death of your servant. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Our second reading comes from 1 Peter. The imagery of exile is used to help the readers of this letter understand that they are strangers in a strange land. Christians no longer belong to this age. Through the death of Christ, we belong to God, so that our focus, faith, and hope are no longer on such things as silver or gold. Here is the reading. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, 
live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have a genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart, you have been born anew, not a perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. Here ends the reading. reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Now on that same day, when Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene, two disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. 
And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. And then one of them said, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides this, it is now the third day since these things took place. No, moreover, some of the women of our group astounded us. They went to the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. And they were saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told them what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread, the gospel of the Lord. Of all the Easter encounters recorded in the chapters, the final chapters of the four Gospels. This particular incident might be one of the more well-known, and I would say maybe the most beloved. This particular story is an inspiration for a Greek artist who painted a, a painting he called The Road to Emmaus, and may, maybe you have seen it. It is a picture of a, of a tree-lined path Brilliant sunshine descending from the sky. Three men walking together. Jesus in the middle, his arm raised as if to punctuate and to emphasize a point as he is sharing a, a commentary. Cleopas and the other disciple flanking him, held in rapt attention as if being nourished by every word that comes from this stranger's mouth. Two things I want to point out, however. First, notice again, Jesus came up and walked along with them, but they were not able to recognize who he was. If you recall in John's gospel, in his telling, Mary comes to the tomb, and as John tells it, Mary turns her eyes from the tomb and looks at Jesus, but she doesn't recognize him. She thinks that he is the gardener. And then this morning, this morning we have two disciples who meet Jesus on the way, but they don't recognize him. So the question is, what in the world, what in the world is going on? Now, one commentator says that in regards to Mary, that perhaps she was blinded by tears. Maybe so, but I don't think that's a really good explanation. And then there's another commentator who says about our two disciples this morning that more than likely they were walking west and they were blinded by the sun set. My thought is, when it comes to this, is that, and I don't say this myself, but I follow the scholars that I often read and spend time with, is that when all is said and done, 
where it comes face to face with, with a mystery. A real, genuine encounter that is so far beyond our normal day to stay stuff that, that the wisest thing perhaps to do in the face of, again, of this mystery is to simply be amazed. The second thing this morning that I just wanted to point out to you is that we have absolutely no idea where Emmaus is. Luke relates this early evening Easter encounter, and the other gospel writers as well. We're all well acquainted with the geography of Judea and Galilee. They, Galilee, they all knew the lay of the land. But in spite of that, we have never, ever found it. No archaeologist that I know of has uncovered a sign and says, look, Emmaus, next two exits. Now, my understanding is at the present time that there are actually three towns in the Holy Land that go by the name of Emmaus. And more than likely, more than likely what's going on there, and, and, and I guess in saying this, I, I'm kind of giving away the fact that I'm, I'm old now, is some of you will remember the sign, George Washington slept here. Not exactly historically accurate, but possibly good for business. In a way, it's almost as if this little village of Emmaus has been just erased from the map. And that, by the way, is not unheard of, but it's still strange. Yesterday, as I sat at my desk attempting to put this together for you, I found myself wondering if 2,000 years from now, imagine the year 4,020, will anyone be able to find Mount Clemens? And I guess, I guess we could say in a way then that Emmaus is nowhere. And yet in a deeper and a much truer sense, Emmaus is everywhere. As Fred Buechner says, Emmaus, and everyone has their own Emmaus. It's a place where we go, in a sense, to, to retreat and to escape and to forget about life and its vicissitudes for a while. And that's not a bad thing. The point, though, is that sometimes we can spend too much time in Emmaus. Emmaus, for some, could be a bar, or it could be a bottle that maybe we really need to, to put down. Emmaus could be watching TV, uh, in a sense, that's never turned off, that fills a home with a constant barrage of noise and images and perish the thought of turning it off because that would mean silence and that would also mean that you would, well, you know, Emmaus could be surfing the internet for 10 hours a day and that's just for a start. The fact of the matter is that no matter what you do for Emmaus, no matter where you go, no matter how far you go, no matter how fast you go to get there, the undeniable fact and the unfortunate fact is that there you are, wherever you go, our troubles are largely portable, and they always, always go with us. These two disciples this morning are making their way to Emmaus, and they're going because they're trying to forget and to, in a sense, lay down the troubles of the week. They are going to Emmaus to forget about Jesus and to forget about the great failure of his life. Jesus, who stood before the Roman Empire, much like, do you recall some years ago, the lone gentleman standing in Tiananmen Square in front of a tank? And yet in this case, in Jesus' case, the sad and unfortunate truth that the tank ran him over. These two disciples are numbed and dazed and confused, then Jesus comes right alongside them. He steps right into the midst of their pain and their lostness. And they tell this stranger straight away, for we had hoped, for we had hoped. But we have faced the facts, and we have given that hope up. We have dropped it like a bad habit. All of our hopes and our dreams that we have harbored in our hearts, all of the things that this man did to our hearts, all of that is sunk far, far out 
at sea. And Jesus begins to speak to them. He, he opens the scriptures to them. In my own life, and I hope this is true for you too, I hope, in my own life I have found that there are some people, a few people, who for whatever reason it is, they seem to have this uncanny ability to shed light on whatever darkness I happen to be in at a, at a given moment. They have this ability to bring perspective that enables me to put things in place and to begin to see life in a, from a different perspective. Pain and failure begin to fall into place. And by the grace of God, I rise to my feet and I'm ready to try once again. As one commentator says, Jesus has that ability to make sense of things. For these two lost disciples, and also certainly for us. Jesus opens the scriptures, and he begins to show them that in the broad expanse of the story that the Bible tells, that there is a purpose, a divine purpose. Admittedly, it is not always recognized. It is not always easily discerned, but that there is a purpose that is working its way through the world, a plan for the sake of the world that involves a death and a resurrection. Shockingly, because that's what it took. For the true enemy in all reality of humanity was not the Roman Empire. The true enemy of humanity today is not the tyrant of the weak, the true enemy of your life and mine are the powers of sin and death. We read, they came to the village and he acted as if he was going to go on, but they pressed him, stay with us, eat dinner with us. You see, they invited him in. He wasn't going to force himself on them, but they invited him in. He will never force himself on us. He'll never force himself on you. As a Lutheran Christian, I've always believed and I have tried repeatedly over the course of three get dates to tell my dear good friends at St. Mark that Jesus doesn't hide. He has told us again and again and again where we can find him. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You see this? You see this all here? That's why this exists. That's why this place was built. This is my body, this is my blood, broken, shed for you, for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And the breaking of the bread, which even this morning, if you are as dull and thick-skulled like me, you clearly get the impression from the text as I read it that this is, as someone said, semaphore for Holy Communion. That the bread that we eat, the wine that we drink, is not simply a memorial to somebody who died ages ago, but that Jesus is as real and as present to us here and now as he was sitting at that table at Emmaus all those years ago. And notice the response. Not lingering, depressive grief, but joy that is so startling that they actually get up on their feet and they run all the way back to Jerusalem because news this good has got to be shared because faith always dies in isolation, but it is nourished in community. Faith always grows as it is shared that we are not, any of us, meant to carry our confusion and our doubts and our questions alone. And in the midst of this gathering in word and sacrament, and in the presence of good family at St. Mark Lutheran Church, Jesus is always here to help us make sense of things. Just a few weeks ago, the Queen spoke to the citizens of the United Kingdom I think in 30 plus years, I don't think I've ever quoted the Queen once, but there's always a first time. And she said, she said that perhaps as never before, 
We need Easter. We truly need it. And I would add, no disrespect to the Queen, is that we have always needed it. But maybe in the midst of all of this confusion, maybe for the first time in some of our lives, we are aware of that need. That the desperation of this time makes the resurrection essential. And the good news that, is that all these years later, Jesus can meet you at your Emmaus, wherever it might be, that Jesus can help you make sense of life, your life, and to help you rise once again to your feet and to try again. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sisters and brothers, let us join our hearts in prayer. Lord God, we pray for your church that reborn as children of God, we recognize Christ's presence with the eyes of our heart, his presence moving within and among us and leading us out again and again and again to be light for the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Loving Lord, we pray for the world and for those who govern it, that when blinded by fear and mistrust, eyes are opened to the ways of freedom and reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate Lord, we pray this morning for those who are in need, for those who are homeless, those who are lost, those whose hearts have been broken, those who are orphaned, and we remember, especially today, those who are sick. Judy Zato and Wolf Baring, Janet Lipinski and Cynthia Gaffigan, Jamie Nowicki, Liz Zizek, Helen Cerny, Roy Doby and Janet Robinson. We remember before you today, Dennis Lapointe, and those that we now name before you out loud or in our hearts. For all for whom we pray, we ask that you will come to them with fresh power and that you would make known to them the wholeness that only you can bring. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And now we receive our prayers, merciful God, and dwell in us richly through Jesus Christ, our life and our Redeemer. Amen. Sisters and brothers, as Jesus has taught us, we have the courage to say together, Our and Father in heaven, heaven Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. He is risen. He is risen indeed.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, the gifts of God for the people of God, holy things to make us holy. 